Determinate Content Podcast, a philosophy podcast about articles and books in metaphysics, meta-metaphysics, meta-meta-metaphysics, meta-meta-meta-metaphysics, and meta-meta-meta-meta-metaphysics, but also adjacent areas. Hope you enjoy the content. If you do, be sure to smash that citation button. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Determinate Content. Today, we have with us Richard Gaskin, who is Professor of Philosophy at Liverpool University. He got his DPhil from the University of Oxford under the supervision of Michael Dummett, and he is the author of several books and articles, among others, The Unity of the Proposition, Language, Truth, and Literature, a defense of, the Defense of Literary Humanism, Experience and the World's Own Language, a Critique of John Dowell's Empiricism. And today we are discussing his 2020 book, Language and World, a Defense of Linguistic Idealism. So thank you very much, Richard, for being on today. Thank you for inviting yes. me. Uh, before we get started, I was just wondering if you'd like to introduce yourself in more depth and also maybe try to answer the question as to why philosophy and particularly metaphysics is, is a worthwhile pursuit, if you can, in a few, few words. <laughs> okay, I'll try. Yeah. Um, yes, well, I'm interested in, I suppose, uh, my main two interests are language and literature, language from a theoretical, philosophical point of view. And, and also literature and literary criticism, the European literary tradition. But today we're talking, I think, really about the relation between language and world. And that's something that's always fascinated me um, because I guess from, although I didn't, as it were, formulate the doctrine of linguistic idealism in much detail early on, it struck me early on in my study of philosophy that I just had that I just had this very strong feeling that there must be some deep dependence of the world on language. And that this was a this was a highly significant and surprising fact because um language is, you know, we think of language as an evolved phenomenon, as something that evolved with human beings after human beings had evolved, so that it's a highly contingent empirical phenomenon. And yet seems to me in some sense, and we'll get onto this no doubt, true in, in some kind of transcendental sense that language underpins the whole idea of there being a world containing objects with which we engage. So I guess that idea fascinated me from, a, from an early stage and I've spent a lot of time trying to work out some of the details. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's what I'd want to say by way of way of introduction because just to stress again the point that if it's right that there's this deep dependence of the world on language that's I, I, one one impression I get from talking about this with other philosophers is that they don't quite understand how incredibly radical no. <laughs> how, that would, how enormously surprising that would be um, and it you know I mean it, you sort of feel well it can't possibly be true for that reason. And yet I can't sort of get my head around how it couldn't be true. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I understand. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess that's a, a reason why it's worthwhile to do metaphysics, because you get up, you get to surprising conclusions that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, well, let's get to your book then. Um, so in your book, you understand linguistic idealism as the thesis that the world is a precipitative language, that objects are the inner uh, internal accusatives of language, and so are essentially meanings, and that whatever exists is nameable and describable. And a crucial step in this, uh, in the argument towards this thesis, is, is the context principle. So I was wondering if you could say something about the context principle and how it may be used to derive linguistic idealism. Yes, certainly. Um... Well, I mean, here I was really inspired by some of Dummett's writings, um, although he doesn't, I think, consistently um, push the line with that impresses me, that I'm impressed by, mm. um, which is the thought that, um, I mean, the context principle, you know, when, when you formulate it, um, a word only has meaning in the context of a sentence, you sort of think, well, yeah, uh, so what? That doesn't sound like a big deal. And the contribution, one contribution that Dummett made, I think, and which was then picked up by others, uh, the so-called neo-Fragians like Crispin mm. Wright and Bob Hale, yeah. 
is the is the thought that actually it is a big deal the context principle because it um, the significance of it is that it undercuts a kind of nominalist traditionally nominalist view of the engagement of language with the world which as it were thinks of the world is already there with its objects and then human beings come along and they start by picking out objects using names that's kind of the first stage and um of course to begin with they name concrete objects so their, their names are names of concrete objects and it's only at a later stage that these that more complex uh, or di that different and uh, more sophisticated linguistic items come on the scene and that then these items get put together with names to form sentences um and if you've got that kind, and that may well be historically accurate the way way things happened historically um but if you've got that picture of metaphysical priority going mm. then you're going if, if, if i mean what i mean is if you think that that reflects metaphysical priority mm. that uh, possible historical story then you're going to think that concrete objects are, are as it were the really real they are the prime mm. existence and we can as it were name them we can focus in on them, we can attach labels to them in advance, really, of having a language. Um, you know, this is a, a, an idea which Dummett has expressed by saying, um, you know, that there's a sense in which names are not part of the language, they're somehow prior to language. And then, of course, it becomes a question you know, once you've got your concrete objects, it becomes a question, well, what else exists? And so you have traditional nominalist mm. headaches like universals and mm. abstract objects in general. Do these exist? Do these really exist? Do we really need them? Um, and the point of a sort of throwing the context principle at that whole nominalist way of thinking is to say, look, no, um, names don't come in advance of the rest of language, not metaphysically speaking. They may have done as a matter of historical fact, but metaphysically speaking, names are syntactic objects like any other kind of word, and they fit into sentences. Mm -hmm. And that's essential to them. It's essential to a name that it can figure in syntactically with other words in a sentence. Mm -hmm. So that even at the primitive stage where you have early humans just sort of grunting and, and using names as labels, if there was such a stage, there's still an implicit sentential context there, even though these humans, as we're conjecturing, couldn't utter complete sentences. Nevertheless, that was implicit in the whole, in the whole scenario. They were saying things that can be expressed in propositional form, even though they didn't themselves have sentences at their disposal. Mm. So that even then, if we're, if we're really regarding what they were using as names, there must have been an implicit syntax there and an implicit sentential syntax. Mm. Um, so in fact, metaphysically speaking, the name does not come first in any real sense. And names of there's nothing privileged about names of concrete objects. So the, the nominalist thought that, you know, we at least know that tables and chairs are real. It's then a further question whether numbers are real or whether mm. justice and holiness are, are that's that's another whole other matter. But at least right. we know that tables and chairs, concrete objects are real. There isn't that priority, I'm afraid. The nominalist has got that wrong and the context principle shows us why. Uh, we, there's no privileged picking out of concrete objects in advance of talking about anything else, including justice, holiness and numbers. Right. Yeah. Um, all words are, are are syntactic items that fit together in a sentence and are on a level or on all fours as far as that is concerned. Mm. So that if we're finding if we're then making the theoretical move of assigning reference to, to one sort of word, that there's no reason to do it in the case of proper names and not other sorts of words as well. Mm. Okay. Right, just, just one clarification. Nominalism here does not describe the metaphysical doctrines that there are no abstract objects or universals, but it describes the kind of Augustinian picture of language maybe that Wittgenstein attacked, that we pick out oh. pre-existing things using names. Uh, and well, that they actually, are something. yeah, no, you're right that yeah. it does. Um, you can use it as a label for the Augustinian picture, mm. but I, I was actually using it in the traditional sense of 
uh, of somebody who thinks that there's something privileged about concrete object. Mm, okay. They definitely exist. But then it's a further question, and one we can we can answer in the negative if we want, whether abstract objects. Exist. All right. Well, that's interesting because when I read when I read the section of the book that talks about this, I I thought that nom the nominalist perspective couldn't be the classical division, but it had to be that you kind of privilege names before sentences in some way, or the context in which the names appear in sentences. But okay, that's very interesting. No, you're absolutely, let yeah. me just quickly say, yeah. you're absolutely right. Um, it does connect with the Augustine, but I was picking up on Dummett, mm -hmm. and Dummett does use the term nominalism, and he regards the context principle as, you know, a tool, and yeah. a way of refuting nominalism in mm. that traditional medieval sense. That's interesting. Okay, yeah. because he thinks that the nominalist's fundamental error is to think that there's something special about names. Mm. Yeah. And that, that's what the context principle upsets. It right. says there's nothing special about names. They're just words with a syntax like any other kind of word. Right, yeah. So Dummett is in effect, I mean, nominalist never said that explicitly, mm. if you like, but the Dummett is doing a bit of diagnosis. He's saying, mm. that's really what's going on here. The nominalist is privileging names. Mm. Right, okay. So the next thought I think a lot of people have when they when it comes to linguistic idealism is that the notion of dependency here, you, you, you said metaphysical priority, that sentences are metaphysically prior or over things in the world, must be interpreted in a maybe temporal sense or in some sort of possible world's sense so that you claim something like the, if language did not exist, I mean, if this contingent evolutionary product of language did, does not exist, objects will not exist either or could not exist either. But that's not the sense that you interpret it. But you, you say that there's a, an empirical sense in which language is contingent or dependent on the world, but there's a transcendental sense in which objects are dependent on sentences and then language. So I was wondering if you could explain what transcendental dependence is and whether, I mean, if we don't understand it as in this kind of possible world sense, does it have any content to say that stuff in the world is dependent on language if, you know, there are a bunch of worlds in which no, there are no human uh, speakers, but there still are objects. Yeah. Uh, so. Well, indeed, and, and, and our world used to be one of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, this, this connects with the, the, my introductory remarks. So, I mean, obviously, uh, it's the case that um, empirical language has evolved um, naturally. Uh, over time, and uh, for most of, I mean, for most of human history, let alone the history of the, of the planet or the universe, mm -hmm. uh, there's been no such thing as human language. There may be other languages on other planets. We don't know about that. But at any rate, from our perspective, language is very much a contingent, evolved phenomenon. However, so that's the empirical sense in which language depends on a pre-existent world mm -hmm. in order to evolve. But the transcendental sense flips that round and says, yeah, but objects themselves are possible targets of the reference relation. That is, that is what it is to be an object, mm -hmm. to be something that a word can refer to. So that the, although there doesn't have to be an actual empirical language on the scene for there to be an object, there has to be the possibility of a language coming along, an empirical language mm -hmm. coming along, and talking about that object, if it's genuinely to be an object. Mm -hmm. So objects, as it were, make make a place ready for language. There's a sort of mm -hmm. slot there for language to fill at any stage at which there is an object. It's mm -hmm. part of the very idea of an object that it can be talked about in some language or other. So it's, it's in that transcendental sense, objecthood does depend on language. Right, but couldn't, uh, uh, yeah, right. But couldn't a realist, a metaphysical realist say that this is because, uh, I mean, that objects are in some sense metaphysically prior, but they nevertheless do have this, you know, like, they're nevertheless, you know, part of a book of the world or whatever it is. Uh, and, and that hum, human languages have evolved to pick up on the the... Uh, uh, to describe these objects and uh, their place in the in the world, um, so yeah. that so that they would deny the priority thesis, but still grant that you know all all objects are possibly um, referred to or capable of being referred to. Um. Right. Yes. So the idea there would be um, it's not essential to objects mm. that they. 
uh, be nameable or referable to in, in language. But in fact, they are. Mm -hmm. And what has happened in history is that languages have evolved to talk about them. But um, there was nothing, as it were, in the initial conditions which um, particularly made space for that. Mm -hmm. I mean, but you see, the, the, the transcendentalist response is, mm -hmm. is I mean, you know, yeah. well, it happened, so it must have been possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so it must have been it must have been possible yeah. for objects to be referred to in words, and that's you know that takes you quite a long way. The existence mm. of that possibility, um, you know, why should it? You yeah. you, you might yeah. want to think, well, why should that possibility be mm. be written into the nature of objecthood? Uh, that at some stage in the history of the universe some creatures should evolve to speak some sort of, make some sort of funny noises, which have mm. the property of talking about these very objects. Why should that be written in to the, their very constitution that that's, that's a possibility, even if it never happens? Mm. Um, right. And you argue that idealism provides the best explanation of this datum, if you will. It's... Well, yes, I mean... <laughs> That, it seems to me that that points to an idealistic conclusion. Um, I mean, it's not it's not as it's not so much that idealism explains it. Idealism just, as it were, states the fact that the world has written into it, as mm. it were, this possibility of being talked about in language. Right. So that, in that sense, dependent on human language or language right. which is sufficiently like human, that takes us yeah. into a, another area. Right. Okay, I had okay. So I have one question uh, on that. We're gonna skip a little bit in the the list, but okay. uh, so I was wondering about when I when I read some of the stuff in in your your work. So for example, you write um, you write that in the in the beginning was a meaningful sentence that is the given, and everything else is theoretically posited in the sense of being transcendentally deduced as a necessary condition for that uh, of that given sentential reality. I mean that. Maybe it's a, a good way of formulating the the doctrine you, you have, but that yeah. that reminded me actually a lot about uh, of kind of theological doctrine. I mean, maybe like uh, John one one that in the beginning was was the word, and I was wondering if you do you see any similarities between those two doctrines, and would you say could you say very crudely that linguistic idealism is is a claim that that we are like our linguistic community is God and we are kind of constitutively determining reality through through language. Or is that kind yes. of a, <laughs> a weird formulation? Yeah, I mean, yes, I mean, I suppose in a <laughs> sense you could give it that kind of theological spin. Mm. I mean, you're right that the just when I say oh, in the beginning was the sentence, of course, I'm echoing mm. the beginning of John's gospel um, right. via you know, Goethe and Wittgenstein, because mm. in Goethe's Faust, Faust inverts that to him, am fang war die tat, in the beginning was the, was the deed. Mm. And Wittgenstein echoes that in the in uncertainty. Mm. Um, and I'm, as it were, I'm saying, no, no, we've got to go back to the <laughs> the Bible. <laughs> in the beginning was the word, that was right. right. Um, and I mean, so, you know, what's the connection? Is there any, is there any, further connection mm. between linguistic idealism and the biblical idea yeah i mean i when i when i when i i've been thinking a bit about this when i mm. read your questions and I, that 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 particular one intrigued me because and I, and this hadn't occurred to me before but if you think about it i mean if you go back to genesis of course mm. where god creates the world in stages yeah and at each stage, what what suddenly struck me, of course, never, I'd never thought of it mm. before, is the fact that God uses language yeah. to do this. Yeah. Let there be light. Yeah. God says mm. it's not, you know. Whereas what you, you know, surely what you'd expect is the description of creation to go well. First of all, God created light, and then God created this and that, mm. the animals and so on. It all came along, and uh, you know, eventually when there were human beings, uh, maybe God taught them language. Mm. That's actually a, a one view, common view of, or I shouldn't say perhaps I don't know how common it was, but it, it was certainly a view that you got in the 18th century 
theory. Mm-hmm. A number of people promulgated this view because there was a considerable amount of interest in the 18th century in the question, what is the origin of language? Mm. And one theory was, oh, well, God taught human beings, language. God taught Adam language, mm. and then Adam passed it on. So, I mean, you, you might have expected that kind of story to be already there in Genesis. Um, and I mean, maybe it is supposed to be there implicitly, but uh, it's very striking that, you know, G- God's already got language and God right. uses language yeah. to create the world. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah no. That's just very strange. Why should it why should it require a word to be spoken for light to be created? Why can't God do it without language? Because God is a neo Phrygian. <laughs> <laughs> well well yeah, one does start to wonder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well that's yeah, that's um that's an that's an interesting but it certainly perhaps points to that the the question of the priority between the world and language is has deep origins. Maybe, yes. Yeah. I mean, maybe, I mean, it sounds a bit ridiculous to say maybe the author of Genesis or the author of John's <laughs> Gospel had some kind of right. feeling that maybe linguistic idealism was right. Yeah. That would be perhaps an absurd thing to say, but but it is very striking that mm. um, words get in on the act of traditional theological creation, at least in the, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, mm. very early on. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I'm just trying to. Yeah. Right. But you. But do you? Because um, I spoke earlier to Thomas Hofweber, and he conceives of ide- like linguistic idealism as a definite alternative to theism. But you. You. Yes. Uh, like you know, Domet was uh, was a Catholic, but you don't. You he don't, was. Yeah. You don't. You don't subscribe to any. Uh, no, I'm not a theist. Yeah. Um, and I. I on the whole, I, I would agree um, I, with Thomas, really, that um, when you think it through, um, I mean, in a sense, it's been implicit in, in what in, in what I've said. Because yeah, if, yeah, you, yeah. if you push the idea, well, you know, where did where on earth did God God get this language from in order mm. to say let there be light, and what give, what gives this language meaning? How can it, you know, mm. you, you start sort of getting into the whole Wittgenstein private right, language right, thing. Right, right, yeah. And yeah. <laughs> it, it starts to look impossible that God could actually have a language. Right, right. Um, yeah. So I would agree that actually linguistic idealism points away from theism. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, well, that's interesting. Okay, I think maybe we have to to go to uh, to further topic, uh, maybe leave okay. theism, because it could go on forever, I guess. Uh, could, yeah. Um, so I was wondering about, uh, if we're looking at this constitutive act, the speech act of, of um, describing, uh, describing objects and then um, endorsing sentences from which these objects kind of theoretically are posited. Uh, one, uh, you know, a lot of criticism towards the context principle in use in that kind of uh, metaphysical light has come from contradictory properties and so on. So, I mean, the property uh, or sorry, the predicate is non self exemplifying is obviously can obviously figure syntactically in in sentences. But a lot of people say that this is not a property because there are no contradictory properties. Uh, yeah. But but you you say that anyone who takes this kind of link this syntactic priority seriously will have to acknowledge the existence of such properties, mm-hmm. uh, and you get around the problem of paradox by by kind of dividing reality or language and reality into primary and secondary division. And yes. as was clear to me in my in in our email correspondence, I'm not sure I really understood uh, understood it. So I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit about this kind of very extreme, extremely radical thesis. I, I Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, yes, I'm not sure how ra- radical. I don't think it's particularly original. Mm. I mean, in the sense that if you look at the literature on the semantic paradoxes, mm. you can certainly find the idea that um, there's something... Um, what's the word? There's something... Ab- if I can put it, if I can use the word, there's something a bit decadent about mm. paradoxes in the sense that um, they only they only arise at a kind of late stage. Right. So thinking yeah. again in terms of our development of language, metaphysical, what's what's metaphysically prior to what? Because 
and, and this is my, and, and I'm sort of picking up this idea, which I've, I've got from the literature on the paradoxes, mm. that really the, the basic function of language is to talk about the world, not talk about itself. Mm. That's, you know, that's its, its fundamental purpose. Um, you get into paradoxes when language turns in on itself and starts describing itself and talking about itself. And if you don't place any restrictions on that, mm. then very soon you generate paradox. Uh, so your example, the, the, the Grelling paradox of mm. a, a property of, of not being self-exemplifying, heterological, that's a case in point. Um, but... Uh, so, so my my thought is simply that um, you uh, you know if you're if you're following the context principle as you as you yourself yeah. said you can't simply deny the existence of a property of not being self exemplifying because it's generated by the language in a perfectly regular way mm -hmm. I mean uh, the, the the predicate is put together in a in a in a grammatically correct way it's 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 a it's a good piece of language so if you're saying well language you know as i'm saying theoret a reference is a, is a theoretical thing language elements of language refer then you've got to say the same about this and say well that predicate really does refer to a property yeah. a paradoxical one but then i think you can you can sort of mitigate the harshness of that conclusion by helping yourself to this idea that, as I say, some writers, uh, I think you get it in Van McGee, actually, in mm. his writings on the semantic paradoxes, um, that, you know, we, let's, not, let's not worry too much about the liar paradox because it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a latecomer on, this, on the linguistic scene. Mm. And, you know, all these awkward customers, they're not there at the beginning. At the beginning, language is, is there to talk about, you know, objects in the world to help human beings get their food and, and survive. Um, and it's only at a much later stage that they start thinking that, 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 that people start to theorize about language itself. Right. Um, so that the fact that it, that language has this capacity to generate these puzzles, these paradoxes um, is, is kind of less surprising or, or worrying. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's a tool you know, it, it, it's a, how, how could one put it? Maybe one could think of it like this as a tool, which is very useful for certain purposes, but it's also, you know, like many tools, quite dangerous in some respects. And, you know, if you don't use it properly, you know, a hedge cutter is an right. extremely useful thing, but if you don't use it properly, you can cut yourself instead of the hedge. But that's, as it were, you know, yeah. I don't know if that's a terribly good analogy, but, um, the idea is of a tool which is designed, as it mm. were, for a purpose, which it performs very well. But then, it, it, you know, it, it's got other aspects to it that sort of come along as part of a package deal. And those are less satisfactory. And you have to be careful handling those. Right. I don't know, maybe if I leave it, just sort of put it like that. Without, I don't, I'm not sure the hedge cutter was a yeah, you, good analogy. You, you, but you, you cut off your head, but it's only at the secondary level. It's not a, <laughs> yeah, a real hedge cutter is not a very good idea, yeah. a very good analogy, because, yeah. of course, you can use it to cut itself as soon as you switch it on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, right. you need, it, one would need a, a tool which, as it were, you know, performs as advertised mm. initially, right. but then at a later stage it can be used in dangerous ways. Right. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, so I guess uh, that's one primary secondary division in your in your work yeah. that's very important. But that there's a, another one as well, which concerns yeah. nameables and unnameables. So in the beginning, when I say your thesis, uh, it was that all you know one one part of it was that whatever exists is nameable and describable. Yeah. But actually, you don't you don't hold that view at the primary level in this other primary secondary uh, distinction because at the primary level linguistic idealism holds you can describe everything but then there's a secondary level which contains sort of elusive objects or unnameable yeah. objects uh, yeah, things so. in themselves maybe but they're they they are dependent on the objects in the first level can you explain that distinction as well and how that differs from i mean obviously there's a dependence there but you know how would that differ from a Kantian, for example, who holds uh, that there are genuinely sort of unnameable objects, uh, maybe so indescribable. Oh, right. Okay. Well, the Kantian position that there 
you know, um, that there are things in themselves, mm. which, as it were, lurk behind the the reality that we can, can see and describe. Um, that's, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not a tr- I'm not a tremendous expert on mm. Kant, and I, I dare say what I'm going to say will be disputed by some Kantians. But, you know. One one way of thinking about that might be to say, well, look, if I if I take an object like this stapler here, um, mm. this is an object which is given to me in experience. Mm. I bring it under the categories and so forth. Um, it's a phenomenal object for Kant. I can see it and describe it and so on. But as it were, sitting behind, lurking behind this stapler is a stapler in itself, as it were, a mm. thing in itself, which I can't see and describe which is somehow causally responsible for this one, but is inaccessible to human thought and language. I mean, you can't really spell the idea out without getting into self-contradiction fairly quickly, I think. But, but at any rate, you know, something like that seems to, seems to be the idea. Although, as I say, a Kant expert may come along and say to me, oh, you're adopting a two-worlds view of mm. Uh, mm. Um, things themselves, and that's not the correct interpretation. But anyway, yeah. um, without getting into that, the, the, the thought, the difference between that and my position would be that for Kant, as it were, it, if I'm allowed my two world strategy, mm. um, there are unnameables standing behind every nameable. Yeah. There's a thing in itself standing behind every thing that's given to me in experience. Now, that's not my view. I think, mm. as I was starting to hint, the whole idea of things in themselves is incoherent. Mm. Um, my view is that. There's a primary level containing tables and chairs and all the objects of experience, and everything is nameable at that level. But then once language is up and running as, as an institution, mm-hmm. it's a bit like the paradox point earlier, but, but the, the splitting of levels is different. It can then, as it were, you can then generate, um, it can then generate itself objects that it can't itself name. Mm. So it, uh, it it's got it's got a capacity, as it were, to outrun its own resources, its own naming resources. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just like I don't know, you know, um, having building materials. Initially, yeah. you know, when you when you're a child and you use building blocks to build towers and things, you know, you you're in complete control. You can you can take it all to bits. You can knock the towers down. You can start again. Um, but of course, human human humans have developed the capacity to build build to build tires which are you know enormous, um, which mm. maybe exceed their powers of grasp in some way. Right. Um, I'm not putting we, that we, very we're, well. We're, we have created a rock that we cannot ourselves. Exactly. Lift, yeah. I mean, we, you can build a wall that you can't climb over. Right. But okay. So just to put an example here, one example could be like an arbitrarily chosen real number or something. That yeah. If if you presume that you would give each real, or you cannot presume that you could give each real a name because of these um, paradoxes of infinity and so. Is that are yes. those the kind of examples you're exactly making? yes? Well, yeah. Very complicated, very complex sets. Right. Um, um, right. Which can't be, and, and there, you know, which can't be discriminated in language from other very complex sets. Mm. Um, and, and here, the finitude of language is important. We, you know, we names have got to be finite entities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, language has got to be usable. Yeah. This brings us back to the evolutionary origin. It's got to be something that human beings or creatures like human beings can use. And so sentences have to be finitely long, words mm. have to be finitely long, and so on. And that places considerable constraints on what you can mm. express. I mean, they're not problems for us because we live in, you know, we live in a finite world. But if you're doing infinitistic mathemati- yeah. mathematics, then you very quickly run out of names right. for all the objects that you can uh, construct as well or imagine exist. Right. Um, okay, so I have one question about the dependency about, you know, what's the dependency relation here? Because in the book, I was kind of struggling to see whether the dependency was upon language or upon the nameable objects. So maybe you don't see a division, but but it struck me as at, at some point you say that the unnameables are dependent on the, un, or sorry, the unnameables are dependent on the nameables. But, yeah. but this is the thesis that they are dependent on language in some way uh 
uh, or the way that we're... Uh, well, they're dependent on the name rules as well. I mean, if you think, just you know, go to your go to your case of a um, you know of a real number or yeah. a very complex set. Uh, yeah. You know, that's constructed of an extremely complex set, a set that is so complex that it can't be picked out in language, mm. is nevertheless constructed from extremely simple okay. resources, yeah. namely the empty set right. and the usual operations mm. and axioms of set theory, mm. which you could write on the back of a postcard. Yeah. You know, okay, I mean, yeah. and that's it. And with, all, with that very basic material, 10 axioms or whatever it is, you can generate mm. this vast world of... Cantor's paradises, you know, mm. uh, in which there are plenty of things that can't be named. Right, but but you wouldn't you wouldn't endorse the maybe Kantian uh, position that there are objects, maybe uh, like concrete objects, uh, but that are kind of outside of the categories in some way. You don't think that we construct yeah. those those objects and put them into existence somehow. Yeah, no, that idea yeah, doesn't yeah, seem to okay. make sense. Right. Uh, okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So another another uh, kind of big, uh, right, really maybe radical thesis in in your book is is about facts and and non facts. So maybe on similar grounds to this kind of syntactical approach to to uh, to ontology, you claim that it's it's trivial that facts exists and that non facts exist as well. So that there's this kind of symmetry between all the obtaining facts and the non-obtaining facts um, which Moore and Russell and so on uh, kind of uh, had to tackle in, in the beginning of the yes. 20th century as well uh, and one I mean one big problem they had is you know why should we care about um, why should we care about the facts when there are these kind of non-facts as well that we could equally kind of theorize in terms of uh, and you have a distinctive kind of response to this which you dubbed transcendental pragmatism. So I was wondering, mm. would you like to kind of <laughs> explain what this what this is and uh, and how it solves the problem of you know why should we care about the facts instead of the the non obtaining the non obtaining yes <laughs> yes and this problem arises for, I think for a linguistic idealist because um, if you. I mean, we haven't actually talked much about this, yeah. but it's one yeah. one aspect of the position that, um, you know, uh, in the beginning was a sentence, as mm. we said. Propositions are then theoretical posits. They are derived as meanings of sentences, and they contain objects and properties. Mm. But in that, we did, we did actually talk a bit about it when we were talking about non-self-exemplification, and, mm. and I was saying, well, you know, there's no... There's nothing in linguistic idealism to stop the generation of the property of non-self-exemplification. Well, similarly, there's nothing in linguistic idealism to stop the generation of false propositions or in any way to, to privilege true ones over mm -hmm. false. The linguistic idealist, as it were, simply says, well, propositions are the meanings of sentences. Well, there are true and false sentences <laughs> out there, so there are true and false propositions, yeah. and the world is composed of these things. Yeah. So the Wittgensteinian aphorism should be you know, at the beginning of the tractatus, the world consists of everything that is the case and everything that isn't. <laughs> right. um, and then, of course, that throws up the problem. Well, in that case, what's so special about truth? Why do we prefer it? Um, how do we generate it? If there's complete symmetry between um, facts and non-facts, as you call them, or truth and mm -hmm. falsity, mm -hmm. how do we privilege truth? Because you want to be able to say, well, um, I mean, if the sort of thing that McDowell wants to say, for mm -hmm. example, is that we're answerable to the facts, yeah. that's to say the true propositions. We're not answerable to the false ones. By we, he means, I guess, not we scientists, people who, yeah. in, in wanting to do any kind of science, mm. you're answerable, as it were, to the facts, not yeah. to the non-facts. Um, and science does seem to be a fundamental human activity of vital importance. So we do, in some way, want to privilege truth. Now, what what warrants that? What justifies that? If there's if there's this complete symmetry between um, true and false propositions at the level of the world, so then I, that's right. I then kind of wheel in a transcendental argument based based on Davidson mm. to um, say, well, truth is. Um, put in a nutshell, the internal accusative of agreement. Mm. So what's really fundamental in communication, or one thing that's really fundamental, I should say, in communication, is agreement, that speakers 
agree with one another um, on most things, as Davidson argues, and I accept his argument that, uh, you know, it's, it's belief is inherently veridical, he says. Mm. So um, mo- we've got to be, uh, speakers, when they're interpreting one another, have got to interpret them, themselves as being mostly right about most things. Otherwise, interpretation would be impossible. And I think he, his argument mm. for that is mm-hmm. successful. So there's a kind of majority class of propositions, if you like, containing the ones that speakers agree on, and then a minority class containing the ones that they don't agree on, and that minority class is very much smaller than the majority class. And then I, as it were, say, well, uh, we don't simply identify the truth with the majority class in the sense as, a, as a, an empirical yeah. pragmatist yeah, yeah. would do of saying, well, the two ones are what everyone agrees on, or most people agree on. Yeah. And it's not as simple as that. Of course, people can agree on falsities. Mm. But truth mm. is what they're, what they're aiming at, is, mm. is, the, is the aim of the, that agreement in the sense that it's, um, it's constituted by the phenomenon of agreement. Right. Um, it's not that it's independent. You have to be careful how you put it. It's, it's not an independent thing. As a real, as a sort of realist mm. might think, which we then try to agree about, mm. right? As it were, as an independent activity. No, the truth, truth is actually constituted by the whole activity of agreeing mm. on things. Right. And it's then a further question: which propositions are true? And that is not a simple matter right. of agreement. Yeah, That's okay. where the, the empirical pragmatist, like Rorty, it seems to me, goes wrong. Right. So, so could you the the solution then? Could you put it in the in the following form that uh, we shouldn't aim to inquire about the non facts because it's po- it's impossible to inquire to use inquire in that sense any kind of inquiry that was named at, at uh, that was aimed at non facts would be kind of a, an incoherent would be kind of sort of uh, an oxymoron in some sense that inquiry just is and facts just are uh, sort of in some sense uh, um, dependent on inquiry such that you couldn't inquire about non-facts is that maybe a good way to formulate it or yes not? i'm not sure about that <laughs> <laughs> um uh, whether i right yes. um So I, I'm just trying to, because the question is, you know, we have this symmetry of, of obtaining facts and non-obtaining facts. And the question is, yeah. why should we care about the, the facts? And then it seems to me that this kind of Davidsonian answer would be that anyone who, a kind of a linguistic community that would be aimed at non-facts would not be, we couldn't possibly interpret such a, a linguistic community in that way, because that would just mean that they're not speaking yes. a language anymore, conducting inquiry. So that the yes. question as to why should we aim at the truth is just, is constitutive of our of inquiry that we yes the or something <clears throat> i think like that. that's right now what you yeah. just said yes yeah. okay because i mean in an ordinary sense you can inquire into non-facts yeah. i mean right but <clears throat> at a deeper level yeah um the whole business of inquiry and what it is namely mm. pursuit of truth yeah um is set up by the phenomenon of communication right. and agreement okay. yeah well that's, that's the idea. Yeah, really, really cool, interesting thing. I, I was wondering another another question I had about facts uh, yeah. was that we had uh, we had Thomas Hofweber on earlier in the show, who's talking about his his argument for uh, linguistic idealism, which actually supposes that that clauses are are non-referential in a kind of domain uh, domain reading that you kind of refer to facts that exist in a domain, and he argues for instead a kind of an inferential reading of of those that. Uh, that yeah. they're not kind of referential in the same sense that um, ordinary terms are and so on. So I was wondering, because your, your work seems to rely on the opposite con- uh, opposite thesis, that we do refer to, to facts and non-facts um, in, mm. the, in the same way that we refer to kind of ordinary objects. Uh, and I was wondering, do you see your work as kind of in competition to one another, or do you see this as kind of complementary, uh, you know, that they, they complete one another as a way to, to idealism or... If you have any views on them, mm, I mean they're complementary. It's com- yeah. say Thomas has a, a sort of mentalistic form of idealism. I would say, is that mm. right? Do you think that was fair? Um, I mean, I wouldn't say that it's uh, it's the view that 
the world depends on uh, on our mental states or anything like that. No, it's not yeah. Barclay. It's not yeah. anything like yeah, Barclay. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's it's not linguistic idealism in my sense mm, because right. it's been on thought. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, dependent exactly. On language, yeah. Um, the world is in some sense dependent on thought. Well, I agree with that. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. but I'm I'm my linguistic idealist wants to say a bit bit more than that. Yeah. Um, thought as expressed in language, and um, you know, because for me, reference is a theoretical relation, yeah, yeah. which is simply applied to sentences and their parts in order to model linguistic understanding mm. there's no reason to apply it to some bits and not to others that mm. that would be motiveless to do that so of course mm. that clauses have reference any any semantically significant component has reference that's just what it is to be semantically significant mm. so i don't go along with him there i mean he follows dummett if you like you might you mentioned earlier when i said mm. well dummett's the inspiration for my linguistic idealism, at least some of what Dummett says, but Dummett says, like Russell, you know, said a lot of things in his long career. And yeah. um, another thing he says and repeats quite often, so it's not a blip or anything, mm -hmm. is that alongside this theoretical conception of reference as semantic value, you also have to accommodate what he calls a pr the prototypical case of reference, mm -hmm. which is a proper name and its bearer. He says that that's got some kind of central status, privileged mm. status in the whole yeah. idea of reference. Now, I don't think you combine those two things. Yeah. I think you've got to say either, <clears throat> excuse me, either reference is a, is a, is a theoretical relation, then it's semantic mm. value. Um, and it's whatever a theory picks out as the meaning of the term. Mm. And then there's nothing privileged about proper names. Uh, they're just one case among others. Um, mm. And the relation between the proper name and its bearer is just as theoretical as any other refer referential mm. relation. Whereas, uh, so, and I think Thomas rather follows Dummett in, in thinking that there's something special about the relationship between the proper name mm. and its bearer, and that's really what reference is. Yeah. And then, <clears throat> you know, other, other relations that I would want to call reference are not referential. Right, right. So you may, in some sense, actually be speaking past each other. Are you using reference yeah. in a more kind of inclusive yeah. way? Okay, uh, interesting. Uh, another question about reference I had was, was you, um, uh, you don't believe that kind of on a mental linguistic level, there are any facts as to whether, what any terms refer to, that there may be different ways of interpreting uh, yes. What we mean by <laughs> cat and uh, and dog and all of these these words. Right. So there yes. there is indeterminacy, massive indeterminacy of of reference, yes. but also of of meaning in general. Right. So yeah. So what? Uh, so you you discuss whether it may be indeterminate, whether the negation sign is actually a sign for affirmation instead of um, yes. denial or yeah. Um, but I was I just had one question about this. So I was wondering if. Does this, given linguistic idealism, does this mean that the world itself is radically indeterminate? If language, if language is indeterminate, uh, and the world is in some sense constrained by language, I mean, isn't is there any fact, fact of the matter, what any objects are essentially? I mean, if if uh, if objects are just the meanings of of uh, uh, of, of objects are the meaning of meanings of terms, but it's indeterminate what the meanings are. Then what is does that mean that it's kind of indeterminate what the objects are? Do you see what I what I mean? What I'm going for? Um, <clears throat> yes and no. I think is yeah. the answer to your question. In the <laughs> sense that um, I mean, it's in what's indeterminate is what words refer to. Mm. So there I'm going along with, and I accept Putnam's and the Quine Putnam permutation argument. Different theories of, of meaning for a language will assign different reference to the words, and they're equally good theories. Mm. So what there is in and, and given that you know objects are essentially reference and the world is it's got objects in it. You, you mm. can say what's in the world is, is essentially an indeterminate matter. It, mat it depends on how a given language is being interpreted. Mm. So to that extent, the answer to your question is yes, but it's not, you know, as it were, once you've fixed on a translate, once you've fixed on an interpretation scheme and or once, mm. once you're, yeah, I mean, once, 
you know, the indeterminacy is is at the level. It's important yeah. to um, stress that the indeterminacy is at the meta level. It's at the level yeah, of exactly. interpreting yeah. a language. There's no indeterminacy for for object language yeah. speakers. Yeah. Right. Um, so you know, this is nothing indeterminate about the fact that I'm talking about this stapler in English mm. inside the language, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, another, uh, you know, an inter a radical interpreter could come along and interpret my whole language mm -hmm. as being about, I don't know, numbers, girdle numbers or something. Mm. Um, but that wouldn't mean that I wasn't really talking about this stapler, as it were, when I'm inside the language. Right. Um, I mean, you could, you could accommodate the, the, in the metalinguistic point of view a bit in, 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 in the uh, object language by saying, well, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm meaning to talk about this stapler, whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. And that, there I'm leaving it open that some metalinguistic interpreter may come along and interpret me as talking about something completely different. Mm. But so long as the truth, as long as truth values are preserved across yeah. sentences, yeah. that's that's not a problem. I'll still be talking about a determinate thing, as it were. It just won't be determined exactly which thing it is. Yeah. But it will be determinate that it's something or other about which the following sentences are true. About right. which I yeah, no, I, I, I'm in, I'm in this in a, I, I agree with that on the object uh, language level, but I was perhaps looking at the kind of meta, metaphysical, if you will, level that, I yeah. mean, suppose that you, I grant the, the kind of um, neo-Fregean or something that sort of nine, the number of, uh, uh, the number of uh, um, uh, pianos is, is, stands for a number or something like that. And, yeah. but so then I agree, numbers exist, but then it's indeterminate whether I'm talking about numbers or, or cats or something mm -hmm. like on the meta level. Yeah. Um, and then if you say the world's a totality of facts or true true sentences, or that the world depends on the true sentences, could you, I mean, is it determinate what the world then is? I mean, on from this meta perspective, uh, if you start with sentences, but then grant this indeterminacy. Yeah, I mean, from the meta perspective, it's not determinate. Right. That's, yeah, that's, that's the, very... the point of the permutation yeah. argument. Um, yeah. The world, if you say, well, the world is composed of propositions, which is mm. what I do. Say. Well, propositions are yeah, essentially okay, sure. the reference of sentences, yeah. and then there's an indeterminacy in that yeah. reference relationship. Mm. So, in that sense, it's not determinate which propositions are in the world. Right. Well, wow, that's very interesting. Yeah. Um... Yeah, okay, so... Um, Let me just finish that. Yeah, yeah. It is determinate that it's either these propositions or these propositions mm. or these propositions where I go through, and here I'm going through adequate propositions that are referred to yeah. by sentences in adequate theories of meaning. Yes, yes. And that, that amount of determinacy is there, and then the claim is that's all we need. We don't, mm. don't need it to be determinate which... Um, which right. interpretation is correct, and it isn't. It, that isn't determinate, so that would be too much to hanker for anyway. Right. But it doesn't matter that right. we haven't got that. Yeah. But, all right. Um, but but do you think? I mean, I mean, supposing that the world, suppose that the world just consists of a kind of an infinitely denumerable set of of, um, of particles or something like that, and then I I have I take your language and I assign truth conditions on the basis of these particles, and so like you say, like there's one. Uh, number that this just means that there's one particle or something like that. I mean, is there is there something kind of uh, scary about the thought that maybe I mean we think that there are, on the on the object language uh, level we think that there are objects uh, or, yeah. or like numbers and so on. But then whether the propositions uh, in fact talk about or mention numbers is is we cannot ever know that. Is that is there something kind of numeral numinal about that or uh, no, I mean, um, I put it? the propositions are, ah, yeah, no, I mean, um, the propositions do contain numbers, the ones mm -hmm. that are referred to by our sentences that contain numerals. Mm -hmm. Those sentences, uh, I mean, numbers is a fairly <laughs> controversial example. Yeah. Why not use something simpler, like, yeah, you know, yeah. state? I mean, so, uh, you know, the sentences we use uh, refer to propositions. And on one, if you like, one adequate interpretative scheme, 
which assigns propositions to those sentences, those propositions contain, you know, books and yeah, chairs. Yeah, yeah. But on another adequate scheme, they don't. Right. And th there will be different propositions. So we mustn't talk. It's not as though there are this, it's the same propositions each yeah. time and it's yeah. indeterminate what they contain. Uh, that's the wrong way to think about it. Mm. There are, the, the proposition is, is individuated by what it contains. Mm. So if it contains a number yeah, instead yeah. of a book, then it's a different proposition. Okay. Yeah, sure. But it, so it's yeah. not determinate which set of propositions, if you like, composes the world. Mm. What is determinate is that it's either this set yeah, okay. or that set or that set where I go through sets of propositions referred to by sets of sentences in adequate interpretational schemes. Mm. Does that? Yeah, yeah, it may. Yeah, but it kind of. Um, I, Is I that think, scary? Yeah, I think it's scary. I think J, I think JJ Smart said something like that. That the, um, that pro something like sentences are made true by noumenal waters, but that his noumenal waters doesn't contain kind of Kantian things in themselves, but contains like particles and and so on. But right. but we cannot know what what the world contains. Yeah. We can just know the true sentences, but we cannot know what stands behind them. And in that sense, it's kind of, you have this kind of Kantian, uh, it, it feels like a, a sort of, we can, we, can, we can grasp the world at level of sentences, but then we yes. just have a, a long disjunction about, you know, what the world would contain right. in terms of propositions. So, um, okay, but then I would reject, I mean, I don't like the idea of making true or okay, truth make, yes, truth make yes. a theory in general, I reject. Yeah, yeah, no, but for yeah. me, the sentences would be true or false, but yeah. that's basic. They're not being yeah. made true or false by anything. Right. That's just, if you just, like the that, that's the real crunch of the linguistic idealism in it. Yeah, right. So that's the identity theory of truth. Then. But you don't... Yeah, but uh, it's part of that, I think, yes. Okay, yeah. Sorry, I don't want to get into controversial territory, but, but, you, but did you... You do not identify... Um, you said that you don't identify uh, truth in the identity of sentences and facts, but in the identity of facts and uh, and propositions, or? Say, say that again, I'm, so, I'm, I'm not so, following you there. Yeah, so, like, what, what in does the, uh, was, like, which um, uh, units does the ident the, the um, relation of truth exist in, or, like, the identity um, uh, exists between? Like, so... So oh, in the uh, in the identity theory of truth. Yeah, yeah. In your um, in your, it it the identity your... theory of truth says that tr truth says that facts are true propositions. Yeah. Uh, right. So it's not sentences or. No. Yeah. That's right. Mm. Um, and. Uh, so. Um, but in a sense, I think that maybe. You know, that's in a that's orthogonal in a way to linguistic mm, idealism. Mm. I mean, lo there are lots of people who accept the identity theory of truth, but yeah. aren't linguistic idealism. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe vice versa. I don't know. But um, uh, yeah, certainly I I, I am an identity theorist. Mm. Um, and and the reason is that it's precisely that I I don't like this idea of facts as somehow brute worldly right. entities that make propositions true. Yeah. I want yeah. that doesn't make sense to me. I, I that facts just are true propositions. Right. Um. Now you can, if you like, going going back a bit on what I said earlier. You can, if you like, say, well, propositions make sentences true. True mm -hmm. propositions make, yeah. Yeah. make sentences. True. You can have a making true relationship there, but it's a, it's um, it's a pretty trivial relationship. It's not metaphysically or substantial. It's kind of an interpretative relationship between. Which, yeah, yeah, because the propositions yeah. are just dropping out of the sentences as their meanings. Right, but they are at the level of the world. The propositions we are identifying, or I am identifying yeah. the world with propositions. Right. So if you want, you can say, "Well, these pro this proposition makes this this sentence true." Mm. Um, the same proposition makes other sentences true. So there is a, a one to many relationship. Right. There. So it's not right. utterly trivial. And and many many different propositions could make the very same sentence true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think. Yeah. I think we perhaps need to move on from this issue, but. That was just something that struck me as, as a kind of yeah. an interesting um, or yeah, maybe just a scary thought. I don't know <laughs> for me. <laughs> um, I was I was one. I wanted to ask you before I had two two questions left before we, we yeah. wrap this up. So the first one is is about kind of 
the existential implications of of idealism because as you stated in the in the beginning you you said that that we often view language as a kind of an evolved feature of just human thought but I, linguistic idealism seems to put human beings at the very center of of metaphysical reality in some sense or, yes. or it's, it's, it's a privilege our point of view in a in a in a way which many people would dispute uh, yeah. or or find very very kind of um, unintuitive or unattractive uh, i was wondering like do you think that this has any implica- linguistic idealism has any implications for the way that we view ourselves in the world uh, and the way that we should kind of maybe act or organize ourselves or live our lives <laughs> um Yes, it's an interesting question, because in one way, as you say, the view does very much privilege human language. Mm. And, you know, that that could encourage, I guess, a certain arrogance on our part, if one, yeah. if one is a linguistic idealism, idealist. But as I've as I've mentioned once or twice in the course of this podcast, um, when we're talking about language, in the sense it's relevant to the metaphysics, mm-hmm. we have to talk about more than just human language. The, the, the linguistic, the, the core of, I mean, humanity still remains at the center of it because any any other language to count as a language has got to be reachable yeah. from our position. It's got to be accessible to us. In other words, we even if it's not a language we can speak, mm-hmm. we've got to be able to see how it could be a language that somebody could speak with enhanced powers, say, somebody... A, a creature whose powers were like ours, but greatly enhanced. Right, so we can see how their language might be a development of ours. Mm. And and then we can say, oh, well, there'll be all sorts of things that they can express in their language that we can't express in ours. But we can see how, how you would get there. It's not a puzzle that um, this really is a language. Yeah. What is ruled out, where the sort of idealism bites, if you like, is... Mm. What is really ruled out is a language that is so radically yeah, yeah. unlike ours yeah. that we, you know there's no way of, as it were, getting to it from our position. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, that that the the anthropocentrism does bite. Um, mm. You know, language for something to be a language, it has to be a, a recognizable adaptation of human language. Yeah. That we, as it were, are starting the whole. Sh- show off mm. and then other people can jump on board if they want but it's basically a human show to begin with yeah um but of course in saying that the arrogance gets tempered by the thought that you know human language can and maybe will develop in all sorts of ways or, or we may encounter alien species who we can interpret yeah. and they can interpret us but they that but they speak very different kinds of language they're, they're really they they are different from us even though they're still accessible Mm-hmm. So we can't be arrogant in the sense of saying, well, you know, anything we can't interpret straight off, that mm-hmm. can't be a language. Yeah. It's not as simple as that. But there is a human centric aspect to it mm-hmm. that um, what counts, what can count as a language is something that ultimately we have a say in. Right. It's got to be something we can in some way recognize, at least in principle, to right. be a language. Right. Do you, can't do you, be too remote from human language. I mean, yeah, I guess my question is, like, do you see any kind of consolation in that, perhaps, that we feel, you know, often we feel kind of lonely in the cosmos or something, that life is yeah. is, is kind of, you know, human human existence is just kind of an offspring of a, of a larger process that we do not, we don't, we don't have any kind of value in that process. Like, do you think that it has any kind of say in those, the more kind of, Questions about meaning and so on. Oh right, and existential meaning. In that we would just no, say I'm that we are. I don't. Yeah, right. Uh, that's that's missed. I don't think there's any value in the world or yeah. meaning in the world. Yeah. Meaning is meaning is linguistic meaning, and that's it. Right. As I can see. Yeah. I mean, you know, there are things that we make that there are significances. There are things that we find significant. You know, I find yeah. talking about linguistic idealism <laughs> something that gives my life meaning, if you like. But yeah. Yeah. in the uh, you know. Subspecie aeternitatis, mm. you know, so what? Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, my, yeah, that's interesting. My feeling. <laughs> that's interesting. Uh, all right, okay, so I think we have to wrap this up, but I have one, one, uh, one last question, because this is, I mean, I, I sometimes feel very drawn towards uh, linguistic idealism or something like, something like that, but then there's this kind of intrusive thought that mm-hmm. I have, which is a, a kind of a picture of, of me kind of going, going down a landscape with a, 
a, like a very strong flashlight and the landscape yeah. is completely dark and but the flashlight is like so strong so i can't see anything that goes outside of the light and then i just yeah. go on and then i walk around in this landscape and i say well sort of that thing exists and this thing exists and so existence is kind of is kind of um, constrained by the light bulb uh, or uh, yes. the, the the flashlight and then i conclude to myself from all of these observations for, for some from this kind of argument that exist the world is is not there's no world outside of the flashlight but yet yeah. i am walking in this this huge landscape with this little flashlight and i am just a very kind of uh i'm a human being with uh, with um, a massive ego and uh, i say yeah. to myself that though i constrain the world and that's i mean i i i understand to the arguments to the effect that it's incoherent to posit you know this wi- wider landscape but on the other hand it's like you know i can't get this thought away from me so what would you say what should i tell my therapist the next time i, I bring this up so that <laughs> he can get it uh, get it away from me well i understand the worry yeah the problem is that that analogy doesn't capture the worry mm. because you can in principle turn your flashlight on anything right so that you know or um it's difficult for you on the basis of that analogy Right. You can't immediately arrive at the thought that there might be things in the world that you cannot mm. grasp in your right. language. Right. You'd need. You'd need to. You see. Uh, uh, here's another analogy, which actually mm. comes. I think this is. I think Thomas is. Or Fieber, mm. uh, made this point. Um, you know, we look at the bees and we see that there are certain yeah. things that bees can grasp. Yeah. yeah. Well, we might. Pr- ascribe a certain primitive conceptuality to them but there are loads of things they can't grasp that we can and now and now a very natural thought is to think well or maybe we're in exactly the same position yep. as the bees there are super beings looking down on us saying well mm. these humans they can grasp a few things but mm. you know we can grasp a whole lot more mm. my res- yeah and that's where the, and, and this is a bit you probably won't like because there the I, my idealism comes in and says well you know, we call the conceptual shots, as it were. We yeah, call them yeah, linguistic right. shots. Yeah. So if these super beings are really to be speaking a language and mm. really to be using concepts, they've got to be accessible from our perspective. Otherwise, they don't count as language and concepts. Right. Um, and that's the idealist twist to it. Mm. Um, yeah, 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 I know. I, I understand that. But then the thought is just that... You know, maybe the best way to—it's a paradoxical thought, I admit—but it's it's a thought nevertheless. It is that, quite that that the best way to understand the world is not through language at all. So you get this kind of mysticism, uh, and it's hard to—I mean, because because the 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 kind of flat-footed response to that is that uh, to that we, of the of the form that well, you know, um, if if they're not speaking a language and they're not stating facts and and yeah. sort of they don't have beliefs and so on. I mean that. You know, you could, the mystic could again just say, "Well, you know, facts and beliefs and so on. All of these things are just your concepts. So yeah. that just that's just a testament of your your metaphysical ignorance or something." Is that, it's kind of I don't like that reply, uh, but yeah. it's hard to get out of your your mind. Um, yes. Um, no, I agree. Yeah. But but then the challenge to the mystic is to say, "Where on earth are you getting this idea of?" <laughs> Rea- a reality that exceeds our concepts and powers. Yeah. Where does that come from? Right. Well, you know, how does it get its meal ticket, so to speak? Right. Well, they can't say that because they... <laughs> they can't say that. They <laughs> yeah, can't answer that question yeah, they because, answer, because yeah. they're mystics. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that has to tie up this conversation, but I, I'm very, we're very thankful for for you having been Thank on you. here today uh, to talk about your, your book. So go and get the book and read it. It's very... <laughs> It's very, it's a very nice book. It's very radical and it has very meticulous uh, arguments. So, yes, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Bye bye. Recording stopped.